as I prayed a lot about today and what, what you know, God, what would you have me say today? Um, I changed the message uh, sometime this week because I kept being drawn to Jesus' final thoughts with his disciples before he, right before he was arrested and, and taken to the cross, right before the disciples all betrayed him and fled because of fear. And um, when somebody's on their deathbed, there's no more small talk, you know? It's like every breath, every word counts at this, this moment. And so what we're going to be looking at is uh, in John 17 today. This is Jesus' final prayer, like extended prayer um, before the cross. This is the prayer where he is basically pouring his heart out to God, saying, you know, this is, these are my last moments right before the cross. I think this is, as we read these, I ask that you even think about this. This is a holy moment that we get to witness as Jesus is praying this prayer to his Abba, you know, to his daddy. So this is good stuff, and I can't imagine a more appropriate message for today. And so um, well, we're going to go ahead and start. We'll be in John 17. If you have a Bible or on your phone, feel free to, to open it, because this is one you're going to probably want to highlight some, some passages. But let's go ahead and start. In verse 1 of chapter 17, book of John, it says, And, Jesus, and after Jesus said this, and... So just kind of big picture, what he said is uh, in chapter 15 and 16 about how we need to abide in him and, and how there is no life outside of him. And that he also tells his disciples, you are going to suffer because of my name. And, but I promise you this, Jesus said, your suffering will turn to joy. So after Jesus had said all of these things to the disciples, he looked towards heaven which is the typical posture of Jewish prayer, where they would, they, they could, they would stand they, or, or sit and they would look up at heaven with eyes wide open. And then he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. So he starts his prayer, glorify me so that I might glorify you. Father, the time has come. This is it right here. Everything that you have done in creation, in history, it's fulfilled right here. I mean, you, you created the universe. You called Abraham and promised to bless all peoples through him. You, you, you raised up Moses to rescue your people so that they could be priests to the nation, as it says in Exodus. Then you, you raised up David and this promised Messiah and this promised future kingdom. And then you had the prophets who, who continually called your people, come back to God, fulfill your purpose, come back. And there was the virgin birth and Jesus be, ra- healing people, raising the dead. All of this, everything that has happened up to this point was, was for this moment right here. Jesus is praying that he knows what's about to happen. In a couple of hours, he will be hanging on a cross. He's like, Everything you have done has been for this moment. Why? That you might glorify me so that I can return the glory back to you. See, in Jesus' words, those last words, he wanted to be so clear that it's all about God's glory. Everything is about God's glory. It's not about me and what I want. It's not about what you and what you want because those are great, but they're fleeting They don't satisfy. We get what we want and we're empty the next day. No, if if you lift me up and you say, Don, we love you, thank you so much, and I say, Lakeside, I love you, and thank you so much, that's beautiful. But but tomorrow, a year from now, a decade from now, a generation from now, nobody's going to know who I am. It's all about God's glory. Everything is about him. His work in the Old Testament was for God's glory. Jesus came for God's glory, and his death on the cross was going to be for God's glory. And as Jesus' followers, we too live for God's glory. We are here to lift him up together as a kingdom-minded community. As a kingdom community, we bring glory to God. So in verse 2, Jesus continued, For you granted him, the Son, authority over all people, that he might give eternal life, to all those you have given him. 
So Jesus is saying, you know, he's the provider of eternal life. Eternal life is under his authority in verse 3. Now, this is what eternal life is, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, this is a paradigm shift because he just defines eternal life in a way that most of us would not. Because most of us, if you'd say, okay, what define eternal life, we'd say, well, when you die, you go to heaven. That's eternal life. But that's not the definition of eternal life, going to heaven. Eternal life is not waiting here on earth to die to be with God. Well, it's like, you know, this is not the waiting room that we are sitting in knowing that one day we'll finally be called into the office and then we get to experience eternal life. That's not it. Eternal life is here. It's now. Eternal life is knowing God. It's walking with God through the good and the bad of life. But it's being with him and him being with us and participating in in what he wants to do in the world. Eternal life is available now. God wants to do something in you and in me and in us now. And that to me is really good news. That I don't have to wait until I die to experience eternal life. No. Eternal life is now and forever It's God working in us and with us now and forever. We are invited to know God. See, to read the biblical stories, we are invited to know what he has done in history. We are invited to read. We are invited to investigate those stories and to read scripture. But we're also invited to share in our own stories with each other to know what God is doing now. I mean, it is a beautiful picture that we get to read what God did, but we also get to experience and share together what God is doing. Eternal life is found in following Jesus because he is the way we get to know God. This is eternal life. And Jesus continued, God, or Father, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. See, if you have your Bible open, this is one to underline. I have... I have brought you glory on earth. Everything Jesus did was for God's glory. And he did that by finishing the work he was given to do. See, Jesus knew this was the end. He was about to fulfill the whole reason that he came. To do everything necessary that we, that you and me, that his disciples could know God. Everything. I mean, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, ever since uh, that moment when, when humanity said no to God, we have owed a debt to him that we could not pay. We can't, no matter how hard we try, we cannot pay the debt that we owe to God, to, that we owe because we rejected God. So God's plan from the very beginning of time, not after Adam and Eve, from the very beginning, his plan was, they are going to rebel against me and owe a debt, and I am going to pay that debt. That was God's plan from the beginning, that he would pay the debt. Jesus was just acknowledging that the time had come. In just a few hours, he would pray in past tense, it is finished. That was going to be his prayer in just a little bit. And so in verse 5, sorry. Oh, it's not on here. All right, I'm going to read you verse 5. It says, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Father, Jesus is praying, this is amazing to me, that he says this, that before the world began, we were together. Father, we were a community. We were one in unity. I mean, this is, in verse 5 is one of those, those Trinity statements where Jesus acknowledges who he is, that he is part of the Trinity. And then, in this prayer, he turns and he prays for his disciples. And that was uh, the next part of the prayer. So no, the first part was it's all about God's glory. But then he pr- starts praying for the disciples. And this is where it gets so practical and so good for us. Because those, those men who have been praying or have been following him for three years now, he says in verse 9, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world. But for those you have given me, for they of yours, they are yours. Can you imagine what it would be like to be a disciple 
you followed Jesus for three years. And to hear him, and they don't understand about the cross yet. I mean, he had told them several times, I'm going to die. And, and they didn't understand yet. Oh, well, you won't die, and, if, and we will die for you. And he's like, you're going to betray me. And they're like, no, we would never betray you. And so all of a sudden, Jesus is having this somber moment. You know, I, I, and, and I think as you look at a timeline, it's kind of hard because uh, you're kind of putting the books together. But the, the Last Supper, the... That, that final communion ha- has just happened and th- they've come out and they're praying, you know, Jesus is praying and they're hearing their Messiah praying for them. I don't know. I mean, it says in scripture that Jesus is constantly praying for us, but to hear those words would have just been so meaningful and powerful. And then he says in verse 10, all I have is yours, Father, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me to the Son, through them, through my disciples. Imagine what's going through these disciples' mind, because Jesus walked with these men for three years. He, he dealt with their doubts, their questions. He, he watched them argue about who was greater. He had told them they were going to betray him, and they said, you're crazy. No, we're not going to betray you. We would die for you. Yet he knew that in just probably in the next hour, all of them would betray him and run. So Jesus knows all of this, yet despite all of this, he says, glory has come to me through them. This is such a different picture of God than most of us have. And I'll be honest, my hunch is a lot of us in this room, we need to hear this point because, you know, maybe we struggle We feel like we're not acceptable, we're not worthy, we can't measure up. But Jesus is saying, I love these men who are following me. I know their strengths, I know their weaknesses. I've seen the mess that they can make, and man, they have made a big mess sometimes. I know everything about these men, and yet they bless me. They bless me. See, God knows everything about you. He knows the sins that you have committed in public. And he knows the sins that you have committed that you don't want anybody to know about. God knows every single thing about you and me. And he adores you. He loves you. He knows you. But he is cap- and he is still captivated by you. He wants to work in your life. God knows the truth. He knows everything about you. He is, Jesus is the fulfillment of truth. Yet he is also the fulfillment of grace. It is truth and grace. He knows everything about you. And he says, and I still love you. I still want you to be a part of my family. I still want you to walk with me. I still want you you and me to participate together that my kingdom come and my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can't... you can't have done something or, or you can't have done something so bad or become something so bad that God stops loving you. I don't know if you need to hear that, but I think that is some good news. That is something I need to hear because I'm a mess. You don't want to know all my mess and I don't want to know all yours because we'd stop, th- we'd stop respecting each other, right? I mean, it's like we were a mess and God knows the depths of the mess. He knows where I'm a mess that I haven't figured out yet. My wife probably does know, but I haven't figured it out yet. And God knows, and he says, I'm captivated by you. I love you. I, I love doing this thing called life with you. That's good news. That's really good news. You bless him. You bring him glory. And God wants to be involved in your story. Like he did with these men who, like I said, were about to betray him. And they all did. They all took off. In fact, even Peter's like, when when other people recognized him, aren't you the one who walked with with Jesus? He's like, no. Yeah, I think you are. And he would even curse and say, I did not know that man. I mean, this is what Peter did right after this prayer. And Jesus says, glory has come to me through them. No matter where you are in the journey, you bless him. You bring him glory. And then he he continues praying. Jesus said, I will remain in the world no longer. But they, my disciples, my followers are still in the world. And I'm coming back to you, Father. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name you gave me. So that they may be one 
as we are one. This is also a paradigm shift because, you know, Jesus is praying the, a prayer we have prayed many times. Father, life is difficult. It's hard. Jesus is saying, protect the disciples. Protect them. And I think Christians, we pray this prayer a lot. Lord, protect us. Protect your people. But see, Jesus' prayer is different because he doesn't pray, God, protect your people from danger. He doesn't pray, God, protect them from sin. What does he say? Look at that last line. Protect them so that they may be one as we are one. What? I mean, we pray for protection. You know, God, help us be protected from people who speak against us or people who want to hurt us or whatever. But these people were going through, I mean, they were about to go through real persecution. Like most of the disciples died for their belief in Jesus after the resurrection. Yet Jesus doesn't pray, protect them from persecution. He says, protect them for unity. Protect them that they may be one as we are one. Help them be a loving, united community who is one people in God. And then in verse 14, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. See, he expected the followers, his followers to, to suffer. He did. And, and we in America are so fortunate because for us, suffering might be you know, a government worker coming against us or about a church having to pay taxes. Oh, you know, I mean, it's terrible. It's a lot of money. But I, I know of a church in Florida that that's what happened. The, com- the mayor or somebody denied a permit and they had to pay taxes. And there was an uproar that this, no- you know, nonprofit organization had to pay taxes. And they were the only one. And everybody was like, we're being persecuted. We're being persecuted. And I don't mean to be, you know, glib about it, but the Apostle Peter, tradition says that he was crucified because he was a follower of Jesus. That's how he died. Except that he wasn't crucified the normal way. He was crucified upside down. I have a feeling that, you know, many, uh, James was beheaded. When we look at what people actually were persecuted, paying you taxes doesn't sound so bad, you know? You know, like, well, yeah, I mean, it stinks that a church had to pay taxes, but let's be real. That's not real persecution like what people right now all over the world are, you know, they're dying for their faith. They're, they're having to hide. They're having to, you know, smuggle s- scripture verses on pieces of paper beca- or m- and just memorize them because they're scared to have Bibles. So, I mean, There are people who are really suffering in the world. And Jesus' final words are, you know, not protect them from the suffering. It wasn't protect them from the world. Hmm. It wasn't that God take your people out of the world. It wasn't any of that. He was like, no, we, I'm sending my people into the world. Our mission is to be an ambassador to the world. See, Jesus prayed for us to be protected while we were in the world. While we were in the world, protect us, that we would be protected from the evil one. This is so reminiscent of the Lord's Prayer, which we talked about a couple of months ago, where Jesus' final words were, deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from the enemy, because there is an enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. There is an enemy. But unfortunately, I think as Christians... Sometimes we confuse the enemy with people. And people aren't the enemy. People aren't. Satan is the enemy. People, I mean, people who want to harm us. People who are broken. People who, who and they're a mess, and they're, they're difficult to, to be with. People who, who uh, take advantage of us. People who believe very differently from us. They're not our enemy. The world is not the enemy. The world is who we've been sent to. The world is, are the people that we're to love. And Jesus continued the prayer talking about the world. He said, as you sent me into the world, Father, I have sent them into the world. See, as followers, this is such a big deal to me. This is kind of like one of my themes in my, my own personal life. Because 
I think I was, I, and I told you this many times, and you know, I was raised to, to separ- be separate from the world. That's kind of the, the Christian tradition I came in. Because, you know, and I know the Bible says, be ye separate. But again, it's not talking about from people. It's talking about from the pattern of this world, the teachings of this world, where you get all you can, can all you get kind of thing, you know. Doesn't matter if you take advantage of somebody because it's all about you. That's, that is the teaching of the world. Uh, you can find fulfillment in, in something. Any, you know, it might be a house, maybe a new car. It might be the next relationship, whatever. And, and, and be separate from that. That is not true. But I was raised in this be separate from the world the people of the world. And then I see this, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them in the world, and I realize we really are Jesus' tangible presence in the world. We need to seek to be his hands and feet in the world. We are supposed to love our enemies. I mean, Jesus said that. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. They're not, they are not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. We're supposed to love people, to know them, to serve them. And this is how the earliest Christians understood their faith. You know, I came across a story. The early Christians in 166 AD, so like you're talking second, maybe third generation Christians. Uh, The Roman Empire around that time went through a really horrible plague. It killed, I have it down here, 30 to 40 percent of the urban populations in in certain areas of the Roman Empire died. Because of the plague. I mean, 30 to 40 percent. Can't even fathom those kind of numbers dying in the big cities. The wealthiest fled the city. And, and by the way, they think it was probably smallpox that was, that was killing everybody. But the wealthiest people fled the cities and they, were, they left the poor to deal with the dead. And so what was common practice in the Roman Empire, love to be a Roman, was that um, if, if a family member started showing symptoms of the plague they would kick them out of the house because there was no hope. If you showed symptoms, you were going to die. And so rather than infect the whole family, they would abandon their family members and push them out on the street. And sometimes the, the people were so sick, they would just lay there. they just lay in the street, you know, the dirt street. Or, I, you know, I think when I think street, I think like pavement and sidewalks. Then I realized that's really ridiculous. They didn't have those. But, you know, so they would go to the side and next to a bush or whatever, and they would just lay there. And I know that the people were just scared because they had seen so much death during this time that it was like, I I just, I can't fathom uh, pushing a family member out on the street, but that's what was happening. It was that bad. And so those early Christians during that time, they were being persecuted for their faith during this time. This is the, the early Roman Empire days uh, before Constantine had changed, you know, made Christianity legal. And so you have these Christians being persecuted, hiding. And when they would come across sick people lying in the streets, often the Christians would take them to their own homes and they'd care for them. And they'd pray for them until they died. And then they would gather up the dead and they would give them a proper burial. And as you could imagine, these Christians, many of them, also infected the disease and died themselves. Yet, during this time, the Christian population exploded. How how do you figure? The Christians are dying by persecution, and they're dying by plague because they're taking care of the people who are persecuting them who end up having the plague. And Christianity's numbers explode. See, the uh, incomprehensible unselfish love that they were they were displaying was so infectious to use the, the, that word that people were coming and choosing to follow christ in huge numbers because of the love see when jesus taught people we've heard it for all our lives i mean it's part of our culture love your enemies but when jesus taught that it was revolutionary nobody loved their enemies you did not love your enemy they were your enemy you hated them. You fought against them. You may kill them. You don't love them. It was an unprecedented teaching, and it changed the hearts of the world. That teaching changed the world. Love your enemy. Why? Because God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world. Jesus came into the world. It wasn't about fleeing the world. It was about loving the world. And it's what Jesus is saying. We have an enemy, but it's not other people. 
Republicans in the room, I want to tell you, Democrats are not your enemy. Democrats in the room, Republicans, they're not the enemy. Americans, Muslims aren't the enemy. Donald Trump lovers, those who don't like Donald Trump and what he's doing, they're not the enemy. And those of you who can't stand Donald Trump, those who like him, they're not the enemy. You know, the enemy is not people who disagree with us about abortion or global warming or homosexuality or taxes or whether we should build a wall between Mexico and the United States or any other hot topic. The enemy are not people who disagree with you because the enemy are not people. I don't know about you, and I know everybody's kind of quiet, so I'm like, ooh, am I stepping on toes? I don't know, because I'm stepping all over my toes, because I get so angry with people who disagree with me. I have so many stories over the past couple of weeks about theological arguments that people have tried to draw me into, and I'm like, stop it! I don't care, you know, and it makes me so mad, and I'm like, they're just so stupid. They're just stupid because they, can't, they think this is the major issue, and it's such a small issue. And then I realize, my wife's like, what are you preaching on this week? Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. I know. I'm still a mess, too. <laughs> See, the bottom line is that we often feel like people are the enemy, but Jesus sent us to people. He said, you know, in that, that previous verse, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world. Father, protect them from Satan. He's the one who is determined to destroy their lives. He's the one who wants to destroy our credibility. He is the one who wants to destroy our faith. He wants to cause disunity. And then Jesus' final prayer, final part of his prayer, he was, this is my favorite part, because Jesus, you know, he prayed about God's glory, and then he prayed for his disciples, those who were following him, but then he turned around and he prayed for you and me. I mean, like literally prayed for you and me. He said in his final prayer, my prayer is not for them, for the disciples alone. I pray also for those who will, future tense, will believe in me through their message. He's praying for you and me, for our church, for us. And he only prays for one thing. And you're like, okay, last moments, he's going to the cross. He prays for one thing. What could it be? That all of them may be one, Father. I mean, what? Of all things you could pray for, this is the big one. That all of them may be one, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. So that they may be brought to complete unity. I don't think the rhyme was intentional, but... I mean, Jesus prays that we would be one, that we would have the same unity that he has with the Father, that the Trinity would be a picture of the kind of unity that we have together. That is astounding. And this kind of unity, it's not that he's saying we have to merely agree with each other. I was thinking, do you know one of the, the disciples of Jesus was Matthew, the tax collector, right? Tax collectors were Jews who kind of, were a little bit traitorous because they started working for Rome and they were collecting taxes and usually taking way too much. And so everybody hated tax collectors. Matthew was a tax collector. And it started, I started thinking, you know, there was another disciple, Simon. If you look in scripture, he's called Simon the Zealot. Do you know what a zealot was? They were, one, they were Jews who so hated the Roman Empire, they believed that there should be violence against the Romans. Jesus called Matthew the tax collector who worked for Rome. And he called Simon the zealot who wanted to kill everybody who worked for Rome. And they were followers. Let me ask you something. Do you think they agreed on everything? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out if they agreed on anything. You know what I mean? So I don't think unity that it, we're talking about here is that we have to agree on everything and that, you know, we have to be perfectly uh, aligned in all of our beliefs. I don't think that's it at all. I think we can disagree and still be united because unity involves purpose. The purpose of our unity as followers of Jesus is up there right above the second bold. I actually 
put the wrong slides in here. I'm sorry, because I bolded the right one. Uh, let me see if it's up. No. Nope. Uh, it says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That the world may believe you have sent me. It's about purpose. Unity is about why we exist and who we exist for. We exist for Jesus and his mission to the world. When people love and agree on their doctrine or they love their denomination or they love the way they do church more than the way they love God and love people, that's disunity. You might be in agreement with the people, you know, I mean, it's easy in a church. We, we, we do think, I mean, everybody who is a, a member of this church is a member. You chose this place because you either agree with the doctrine or you like the way they do things. I mean, you, there's a lot of agreement here, and so we, we choose that. But we can all choose all of the things that we like, and we like the music, and we like the preaching, I hope, and we like all the other things that are going on. And if we like all of that and we're in agreement, that's not unity. That's agreeing on doctrine and the way we do things. But unity is the result of a common love for God and his purposes and his mission. And when we're unified, Jesus continues the prayer with the last, last slide. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. We are a sent people. That is what unifies us. We love God and we love people. We are sent by God to people. People began to discover God's love by the way they were, they were loved on by Christians. That's what that story about the, that plague was. People came to God because of the way they were loved by people who followed Jesus. And so of all the things Jesus prays for in his final hours is that we might be one, united in purpose and mission, that's the kind of community that brings glory to God. But it's hard because people are really selfish and I'm stubborn, you know? I don't want to change. I like doing things the way I like to do them. I noticed this though, and this is the whole point of today. When you're going through transition, it's really easy to become disunified. Disunity is really easy in transition. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago and I think it's a great illustration, but that people are a lot like jelly donuts you know, when you squeeze them, what's on the inside squirts out? <laughs> Thank you. That's, I love it too. It just makes me laugh. But it's the truth because when, when tensions are going on and when you're in transition and when there's a lot of chaos and you don't have a lot of control and you start getting squeezed, that's when the anger starts coming out. That's when the, the frustration, that's when you might yell at your kids a little bit or you might get onto each other because what's really on the inside in the tension squirts out. Most of the time, we can kind of like behave, but then all of a sudden, the chaos happens and the real us comes out. And so during a transition, I find that it is easy to get mad and it is easy, easy to, not, to, to be upset when things don't go your own way. I notice that people, we don't give each other the benefit of the doubt as much. And, and we want things to go the way we want things to go. But that's a problem because... It's easy to get onto each other and see each other as the enemy. But we're not the enemy. And so Jesus prays for unity. Um, for us, Lakeside Community Church, we're going through transition. I mean, I know I'm leaving and you're going to have Josh here for the next three weeks. And I think the elders have been diligently working to get somebody uh, to be the intern through the rest until you, have the, the, you, you guys hire the lead pastor and all of that. But as you continue to search for a pastor, I want to implore you, work towards unity. Because it doesn't come naturally. Naturally, we all want what we want. Unity, it's a choice. It's something that we work towards. So I want to implore you, don't gossip. Because that will destroy a church. Don't, don't talk critically about the leadership. If you have a problem, Matthew is very clear. Go to them. If you have a problem, go to the leadership. Go to them directly. I can assure you this. Your leaders are seeking God. They love him. He has their hearts. I want to I beg you, I beg you to support them through encouragement, 
through prayer. Would you pray for the leaders? Would you pray for the search team that is, that is, uh, is going to be instrumental in finding your lead pastor? Would you, would you pray for the church? Would you pray for unity here? Would you pray for wisdom and direction for all of those who are having to make decisions? I mean, there are a lot of people and all of them are volunteering their time. Would you pray for them that God would give them wisdom? And would you pray for your future pastor that God is preparing their heart right now to come and lead Lakeside so that you can truly become a light in, in Algoma and beyond? I really, that is more than anything what I challenge you to do. And I want to encourage you. Um, over the next five weeks, and I know I always mention these things, and some of you come up to me and go, I hate technology, stop doing this. Sorry, I know, but many of you like to, I mean, most people in here have a phone, a smartphone, and so that's why I do this. But I want to challenge you for, for the next five days. There is a free devotional, a version devotional called The Bond of Unity. I did it this week. I went through it, and it was very powerful. Every day for five days, there's a different scripture passage about what does it mean to be unified, and it is really, really good. I, I, you can find it at that website, tiny.cc slash unitydevo. Isn't that cute? I came up with that. Anyway, um, but you can also go to the Version app if you have that Bible app and just bond of unity or type in unity. And this is like one of the top three that come up. But I did it and it's very good. I want to encourage you to be thinking about this this week. During transition, there's nothing more important than choosing diligently this bond of unity. If you, you can take a picture of that too. I think that would be cool if like everybody picked up their phone and took a picture. I don't know. I just, I'm like, that would be a story I would tell for years to come. Um, let me ask you this. Five days. How many of you think you could do it? Five days, you're like, I think I can do that. It would, cha- it would change the church. Thank you. That would be awesome. That was Jesus' final prayer. That is my final prayer here. God. We exist. We are a family for you. Make us unified. Let's pray together. Jesus, I want to thank you that of all the things you could pray, that you prayed for unity because we truly are a family that needs each other. We are a family desperate for you. And I know that as a family, it is when we are united together in purpose that people find you like those early Christians who served those sick and, and took care of them, that when we're united as a family, you do amazing and powerful things in the hearts of people. I pray that you use us in that way. God, I pray that you, you help us to choose unity. Doesn't mean we have to agree, but that we exist for a purpose and that we love you and we love each other. Help us to do that, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.